y'all in cyberspace have it super easy. And that's why you're like a billion miles ahead of us, right? One way to look at my work is trying to bring some of the good characteristics of the world of bits to the world of atoms. Well, thanks for, for joining me here, uh, Patrick. Um, it's a huge pleasure to, to have you um, and speak with you. Uh, for me, it's been maybe more than 12 years, 14 years um, that I've been waiting to, to mm -hmm. chat with you, I guess. Um, your ideas have been hugely uh, influential on me, as well as, uh, as your father's, David Freeman. Um, and uh, I started with like a strong anarcho-capitalist leaning in my sort of late teens and um, discovered your, your ideas shortly after and um, have been kind of implementing them in, in my own way. Uh, so, uh, you know, today I'd love to chat to you about those, maybe like how your ideas have evolved over, uh, over the past decade or more and um, how your approaches or your strategies to, to realizing them um, have changed as well and how you're thinking about things uh, today. Um, but I guess before we get into that, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hey, I'm Patrick Friedman and I work to try to make new societies previously through seasteading and now through charter cities. Cool. I mean, so why, why make new societies? Because the old ones aren't very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I just, I come at this from dissatisfaction with the current options for countries to live in. I think that countries mostly don't fit my values and they're mostly not run very well. Like they're not run as well as like, you know, a, a mediocre business even. And I come from the software world and a lot of my thinking is applying software concepts to government and laws. And in software, we just know that to get big advances, you need a small team to rewrite things, you know, from, with a clean slate, using the things that they've learned to build things a new way. And I think we need this capability for government. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people uh, might be familiar with, say, something like seasteading, but um, you also were, wrote one of the first sort of poker bots back in the day as well, right? Um, like, uh, that's also uh, a body of work that I found of yours, because uh, I used to live in uh, Bondi Beach and would run poker bots on, on poker stars and collect on the rake. Um, hmm. And I, I guess, like, you know, you, you speak of your values um, and, you know, the current governance systems don't work really well. Like, you know, what are your values and how are these governance systems today um, and which particular ones aren't working for you? Well, I'm a libertarian um, and that's where I come at this from, you know, so I want, I want governments that don't go fight a bunch of wars. Um, I want governments that uh, let people mostly do what they want and kind of trust people to make choices that are best for them. But along the way, you know, what's, what's been grand about this idea is that I started out wanting the country that I would like to live in that doesn't exist. But I realized that to get that, I had to make it possible for people to start new societies and that that would let all kinds of people try out all kinds of ideas of a better society. And I might find out that someone else's idea makes a place that I want to live you know, more than my ideas. Or I might find out that even for my values, my ideas about how to build a society that produces those values are wrong and someone else might might get it right. But I don't know, um, here in the US, we fight a bunch of pointless wars. We lock people up for eating the wrong plants. Um, the whole like financial status of the government is just completely mathematically unsound and running into ruin. Um, just, just, just a lot, a lot, a lot of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if you look at how the United States is, uh, you know, running itself at the moment and like how, a, how, how you might invest in a company, um, being in that much debt and not being able to recover from it, you know, it seems pretty scary um, for how you, how to maintain a country and moving it forward. It doesn't seem particularly very sustainable to, to me. Um, so I, I, I guess like, you know, you, you talked about like the thinking about the country that you would like to live in. Right. Um, and then thinking about like how you would actually start to go, like how you would actually 
uh, pave the way for allowing not only yourself, but anyone else to, to kind of uh, create the societies that they would like to live in themselves. Um, I guess that led to your sort of 2002 dynamic geography essay when you started first publishing uh, your ideas, or at least I think this is when you uh, first started publishing these ideas, right? Um, could you talk a little bit more about the the arguments that you were putting in there um, on like what led to getting to the point where you felt comfortable in, in pushing your, your sort of ideas, uh, politically speaking? Yeah, I mean, that paper was kind of the theoretical um, basis for like for all the work, and it it brought first this idea of competitive governance, <laughs> where you know besides law as software, my other big foundational metaphor is looking at government as a business, and all governments worldwide as an industry, and so I just pointed out that as an industry, the barrier to entry is insane, like. You know, you can start a new website, it's just like a laptop, but to start a new country, like we don't even know how. There's like no recognized process for that. Like maybe you find a territory that's easing its way towards independence. Like it's it's insane. And also there's really high customer lock-in. You know, I can just go down to T-Mobile and switch from Verizon, but to switch countries, you know, that's a big move. It's a big, it's a big deal. And what I find beautiful about this is like, you can just take out all of this like philosophy and morality and all these things that, that we fight over and just say, like, if you have an industry, it's really, really hard for any new firms to enter. Um, it's really hard for customers to switch. Also, the firms are like huge, just like massive. Um, how innovative will it be? Like, of course, it's not going to be innovative. There's not competitors and your customers are locked in. And this is an analysis that just like, you know, to me, it's kind of like cutting a Gordian knot of like, oh, but the society doesn't have these principles, doesn't have that principle. You just got to like elect my guy or all of that, that there are these powerful structural factors that make this industry serve its customers really, really poorly. And then this analysis also gives us a way to fix it. That's not about convincing anyone about, you know, what system they should use or even what mechanisms. It just says, hey, if we can make it uh, make this industry more competitive, like by making it easier to start new countries or, you know, even new jurisdictions, which is the stage I'm at now with charter cities, then we bring competition. And these new jurisdictions are going to be able to try really new things. Some of them will work a lot better. And then they can change the whole industry because if a major player, you know, if if an Apple sees a competitor who's doing a way better phone. Uh, they can either, you know, imitate it and make something as good, or they can acquire it. But if they don't do either of those, they're going to lose market share. And I think it's the same thing with with systems of law that successful startup jurisdictions will pull capital and people, human capital, away from you know the market leaders, the big countries, and they have to either adapt or die. So that kind of approach was the basis of of everything since then. Right, absolutely. I mean, I think these ideas uh, really clicked for me um, in your, your talk that you did for Mises Brazil, I think, maybe 12 years ago or so. Um, and I know that like, you've been working on sea studying prior to that and, like, you know, have been developing these ideas. But this idea that um, government was a product uh, and you could view government as a technology. Uh, and moreover, you know, I was already having strong libertarian influences and, you know, very aligned with anarcho-capitalism. But this idea of yours of like, well, no, just strip away all of the sort of ideology and the morality aspects of this. And let, let's just look at the sort of systems or the incentives um, around um, how we come about policies was absolutely like um, mind-blowing to me, I guess. Um, and... Uh, that kind of led me down a path of like mechanism design, right? Uh, and then, you know, in the sort of crypto industry, we we fuse cryptography and game theory and like we call it quote unquote crypto economics, where you create these mechanisms um, that would allow you to create these systems where um, you could then build any kind of policy on top of or any kind of institution on top of it, um, or even have those mechanisms in the policies or institutions themselves. Um, 
which is, I mean, how did you, like, how did that come to you at all, like, in the first place? Is this, like, some conversations with, with your family, or is this, like, like, how did you find that out or, like, discover that for yourself? Mm. Well, it was definitely influenced by my dad um, and by public choice economics. You know, you mentioned this, the incentives and in public choice is this area of economics that just says, what if crazy idea politicians and people who work for the government don't suddenly turn into angels when they walk into the office? What if they're people like the rest of us who have self-interest and they act according to it? What happens if we analyze things then? You know, same for, for voters. Um, and so to me, this is just like meta public choice. You know, it's just pushing it one level higher and saying, what are the incentives facing entire systems of government in this global ecosystem? And so, you know, definitely was applying that way of thinking. I think I am kind of like a relentless, like meta iser, you know, like always looking to take things up to a higher level of abstraction. Yeah. And then there was this one, I mean, my dad's books, um, both Machinery of Freedom, his Yankat book and uh, Law's Order, his Law and Economics book were influential. And there's this one particular paragraph in Machinery of Freedom which said, what if everybody lived on in RVs? And if you had a jurisdiction that declared war, you know, a city that declared war on its neighbor, and it was an unpopular war, then the next day, you know, they'd wake up and there'd be a general and seven war correspondents. And everybody else would have just decamped and moved on because who wants to be part of that? Um, and, you know, we can't, on land, we can't live on, all live on RVs. But the ocean is actually kind of like that. Um, and that's the, the title of the paper, Dynamic Geography, was this idea that on the water, when you can actually rearrange buildings and cities, that you are going to get an effect a bit like what my dad said, where if you can like threaten to, like if a government doesn't reform, it can like actually lose like city blocks can be like leaving this city and going to that city. And so if you think of the cost of switching on the water, the cost of switching is, is, is way lower because you can switch entire buildings. And so I thought, huh, you know, maybe, maybe the ocean is actually a, a better kind of fundament, better thing to build on. Um, and you know, it is better in that way. It's also very, very expensive. And so it's hard to make it work. Uh, but I also want to note that space in space, you know, you don't even need a giant diesel engine. You can like just get out and push. It doesn't move very fast, but you know, you could push away a city. Um, it's space. It has no friction. So maybe the other places that we humans build will have governments that, that work better. Absolutely. I mean, so I can I can definitely see how you know taking to the oceans um, or being in RVs would be able to reduce uh, the switching costs, right, um, or the exit costs within a, a particular jurisdictional system. Um, but I, you know the other one there is the the sort of barrier to entry to even you know get to a point of like developing out a a, a new governance system, right. Um, like, how do you think about that? And then how do, you, how do you reduce that barrier of entry? Yeah, well, one thing we're doing today uh, with charter cities is that charter cities get to get, get kind of local autonomy over some part of the legal stack mm -hmm. while using some of the laws of the host country. And of course, the host country's constitution and treaties, which are you know always going to be inviolable. And the other thing is that you know, I'm in this to see the the next like brand new systems of government, the new genius mechanisms that, you know, might be way, way better. But today, the product market fit is that if you just um, look around the world and find the best bodies of law and, and copy them uh, and then bring them to a jurisdiction with with honest courts, that this is already a big improvement over most of the jurisdictions in the world. I mean, even if you didn't copy for multiples, if you just said, let's just copy the entire legal system, of whatever country works the best. Well, that's a legal system that's better than all the other countries. And so this just bringing best of breed technology to places that don't have it, like that's kind of where we're at today. But the systems that are doing so, like this is the approach that Honduras Prospera, which is the leading 
charter city, maybe the only charter city by some definitions is doing, is you can opt in to the regulatory system of, I think it's like any of the top 20 OECD countries. You can choose that. Or you can use a regulatory system that they've cobbled together themselves by taking what they think is kind of the best bodies of law from different places and then trying to like reconcile with each other. You can, you know, in software terms, it's like all these modules that were written to like somewhat different APIs and trying to get them to all work together, um, which now should be better than it, than any other. But they're creating this much more flexible modular legal system where if you, if you were like, hey, I have this proposed biotech law that I think is better than any jurisdiction has by far, you can go to Prospera and, and talk to them uh, and have them review and they could adopt this biotech law even you know, just for your company or just for a certain block of office buildings, um, and and try it out and see how it works. So even though we're 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 just bringing you know current best practices to places right now, we're creating these just very different flexible frameworks, um, which will be easier for experimentation too. Last thing, this is a thing that Prospera did that I think is like so punk is you also have the option in Prospera to opt out of all regulations. But you you have to be within British common law, which includes things like, you know, suing people if they harm you. It doesn't mean you can do anything. There's all kinds of remedies. You know, you can't steal, you can't kill people, uh, you can't lie. And you, your, your board and your officers have to be personally liable for any damages and damages are tripled. So it's like, oh, wow. hey, <laughs> if you wanna go on a pure liability system, then you can do it, you know, yes. if you're really willing to put yeah. serious skin in the game. So I don't know if anybody's elected that, but I think it's so punk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have the convictions like, um, and just, you know, the, the assuredness in that, like, why shouldn't you be able to experiment and try with it, right? Um, and then, you know, if, uh, if everyone else is willing to accept the risk in terms of paying for three times the damage, then so be it, you know? Um, and I guess that's kind of the beauty of like introducing like market dynamics into into these sort of uh, into this realm um, because then you can have this kind of experimentation. Um, but I, I guess like before we get to you know uh, to special like zones, um, maybe we should talk a little bit about seasteading. And um, you know, so you're a software guy, you've had these ideas, um, you recognize the sea might be a little bit like this. Um, what was the journey like in establishing the Seasteading Institute, you know, uh, getting it as popular as it became, um, and then the lessons learned uh, from, from that endeavor, I guess? Yeah, let's see. I think, you know, some of this stuff actually before I got funding and started the Seasteading Institute, I haven't talked about it a ton, but um, basically I was, back in the early 2000s, I was on these two Yahoo Groups mailing list. One was called Floating Dash Cities, and one was called Nation Dash Builders. Um, you know, Nation Builders was people trying to make micronations real. You know, small group of you know kind of crazy people. And you know, when I read that sentence of my dad's, those those ideas kind of mingled in my mind. I started thinking about uh, about seasteading, and I found this paper um, by this retired Sun engineer, Wayne Gramlick. And he basically proposed, he was taking this pure, like just build it incrementalist attitude to a lot of floating city stuff. Like a classic was this book called The Millennial Project by Marshall Savage, which proposed building these giant power plants in the ocean that use um, temperature differentials in, in order to make power and bring up nutrient rich water. It's, it's, it's a cool tech, but it doesn't work small. It has to be like huge and proposing these like, just like massive, massive cities. It's, it's pure science fiction, you know? It's like total nonsense disconnected from the world. And Wayne's like, how about we do this? There's a lot of two liter water bottles. Let's get two liter water bottles and like put them in nets and like take those nets and put tarp on them and put like dirt on that tarp and just make like really cheap giant islands. <laughs> um, now in practice, that can't handle like any kind of waves at all. But it was like, like I feel like part of what I, part of what I brought that's that's special to this movement, which you know I partly got from from Wayne, is just this: how can we actually do it? Mm. How can we not LARP it? Starting new countries that would be super cool. 
super hard. Like, what are the real steps that could plausibly get us there? Same thing for settling the ocean. And so, Wayne, that wasn't the right tech, right? The tech he suggested is is, is probably great for making like lake islands, right? But it, it doesn't work in the ocean. But it, but the attitude was, hey, what can we actually build? And then you know, we 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 learned more about ocean engineering and started looking at uh, spar platforms where there's a, a thin pillar. And then there's like a platform above the water, there's flotation below the water. And the pillar means that there's low cross-sectional area. And we started looking at these and we came up with an idea to build like, we had one that was in like a coffee cup and one that was in my bathtub and then one that was in my pool. And we were thinking we would work up to one that was in the bay and one that was offshore. Um, right. Now, again, it turns out that um, people use computer programs to figure out whether designs work and if the computer programs work just fine and you don't actually need to do this <laughs> series of models, right? But the attitude was, how can we incrementally get there? It was the attitude of a, of, of a builder. And so I worked with Wayne a bit. Um, I wrote this book on seasteading where I just researched like all the different technologies that were out there. Like I'm, I'm really proud. There's a battery technology that I picked as my favorite, which was like redox batteries um, like vanadium redox that, um, basically it's, it's not good for portable and it has really, it's, it's heavy for the storage. Um, but you can use it like an unlimited number of times. Basically it doesn't go bad. Like a lead acid battery goes bad. Um, and it, it's actually, it, you know, it's something that's picked up quite a lot. It's still, it's, it's being used more and more and more. So I just surveyed all these technologies and tried to figure out as a builder, like, how would you actually do this? How does admiralty law work? What would your like businesses be that would bring people out there? And you know, I'm I'm proud of this. I'm I'm a programmer. I spent ten years at Google, and I had written my own blog, like blogging software. It, you know, around 2000, when when you know you couldn't just get records. WordPress. Yeah. Um, and so what I did with this book is I made it. It was compiled from Markdown, and every paragraph you could click to comment. And then you could see the comments that, you know, other people made on the paragraph. And so I actually had like a loop of reader, reader feedback, which was amazing. And I would just like edit the book and hit a button and would compile the new version, um, you know, 21st century style. So that was really fun. And I, you know, I, I gave some talks, uh, had some people I collaborated with. And then um, in 2017... Uh, I actually, I, I had a, a live journal, you know, there was actually blogging software by then. And I had this, you know, small, wonderful community of kind of, you know, heretical, smart contrarians, including someone who worked for for Peter Thiel. And um, I was thinking of leaving Google and looking at hedge fund jobs. And so he brought me in uh, to talk to some of, of, of Peter's people. And they were like, no, 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 dude, like seasteading is way more interesting than like another like math quant, like Peter will be way more interested in that. And like, you know, and we agree, like he should be. So they set up a meeting, talked to him about seasteading and he said, all right, leave Google and start a nonprofit and, and I'll fund it. Um, so that was that part of the journey. I mean, this is your, like, you're influential in like establishing like the ZEDIT program as well, right? In Honduras. Yeah. I mean, my, my ideas uh, were, were definitely like one big branch of what was out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I'd started writing about those from, I don't know, 2001 or two. And I got funding in 2007, started the Institute in 08. And then in 2009, Paul Romer gave his charter cities Ted talk. And, you know, I, I don't know if he read any of my stuff, but that was kind of another big thread that that came together um, in in people's mind. And you know, with seasteading, I guess you know I'm kind of frustrated with how little progress we've had since 2008. I think the ocean is is just is really really hard and expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and in the you know 10 years since the Zeta program started, I've been shifting kind of more and more of my effort and attention to land because I think it's just, you know, a lot more tractable. Um, and at this point it's, it's all I work on, but you know, circa 2008, the Seasteading Institute just started this incredible movement, all this buzz. And we got millions of people around the world thinking like, Hey, why can't you start new countries? Right. right. We got that in people's mind. Right. And, of them. You know, 
Yeah. I mean, it had impact. We got made fun of by The Onion, The Daily Show, The Colbert Report. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, you're doing something right. Yeah. Um, What's that? Like, first they laugh at you and then they, you know, that, that sort of thing. Exactly. Then they fight you, then you win. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that you feel a little bit frustrated. Like, I mean, for me, like, that's, that's those are huge wins. I mean, and I, I think, you know, one of your arguments was that, you know, for why some of this innovation and in governance doesn't happen is because there isn't really a frontier, right? Like, um, most of the land is already occupied by existing uh, governments or states, um, you know, whereas previously you'd be able to, you know, travel across the sea and, you know, uh, arrive at a, di a distant land and uh, declare independence or something like this. Um, and I, I guess this is kind of like yeah. um, where I diverge a little bit, right? Uh, so like I'm a software and technology guy. Um, and for me, like the frontier is kind of in cyberspace. Um, and I, I felt like at least the way that I was thinking is a lot of your ideas mapped very well um, within that domain, right? So it's like... Yeah. Um, the barrier of entry could be lowered certainly by, you know, taking to the seas or, you know, if you can get up into space, you know, you could do a whole host of things there as well. Um, but then I started thinking, well, what if you could go over the wires, right? Like, uh, there's a lot of underserviced people around the planet um, that uh, still have internet access, um, but they do not have like stable financial systems or, you know, functioning governance systems. Um, and perhaps with technologies like uh, blockchains, uh, you could create or establish an order. Um, and if you can strengthen it to, to be resistant to um, political bias or you know, uh, any kind of uh, coercion, um, you may have an order that can establish global markets and uh, deploy institutions you know, globally within 30 seconds or less. Um, and moreover, you like you know your argument around switching costs or customer lock-in. You could also you know, to to use one of these systems is largely voluntary, right? You have to transact with it, um, and if you don't like it anymore, you just stop interacting with with the system. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't come with a whole host of other problems, all right? But um, in at least in establishing an order and deploying these institutions, uh, all these new sets of rules. Um, for me, it's really viable. Um, and like, what I also like about it, it's not incompatible with, you know, uh, seasteads or, you know, public administration in a special like zone or in a charter city either. So it's kind of, um, the, for me, the best of both worlds. Um, I, and I guess like one of my questions was like, you know, you, you're a software guy, technology guy, um, you view government as a technology or a system of rules. Um, but, and clearly you saw that the jurisdiction of the physical territory is a must have or a necessary requirement um, to, to make these happen. Like, I'm kind of curious, like, um, why was that the case? And then uh, what sort of systems or rules you know, interest you uh, to deploy within that territory? Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, like y'all in cyberspace have it super easy and that's why you're like a billion miles ahead of us, right? One way to look at my work is trying to bring some of the good characteristics of the world of bits to the world of atoms. Online, you have low switching costs, you have low barrier to entry. And so we can do all kinds of amazing things. Uh, and we have institutions evolve much better and, and, you know, governance, governance of blockchains is super, super competitive. Um, you know, and that's one, one reason I'm, I'm frustrated about the ocean is that admiralty law actually has this super cool virtual property where, um, you know, some people think that like you can do anything on the high seas. It's not like that at all. Um, what it is, is that each ship has to register with an existing country and it's like franchising the sovereignty of that country. And you could change your registration every year. So it's a virtual association between the ship and the country, which makes for like a very competitive market. Like you just have to find one country in the world that will work with you to let you have what autonomy you want. And so that's this is like a super cool aspect of the sea. So I wish that it was more economically feasible to build there. Um, you know, but but on land, I think things just don't they don't work as well because we have these 
you know, giant geographic monopolies and land is not rearrangeable. Um, you know, one thing that I've been, I've, I've been really happy about in the charter city world, um, I just found this out about the, uh, the uh, Catawba SEZ, which is the only one in the U.S., um, that you can, the, the tribe has the right under North and South Carolina law to buy land on the private market and have it become part of the tribe. The Hunter Azetta wow. program has the same thing. You buy land on the private markets and then it's incorporated in. In fact, I went to Prospera a month ago and I got gene therapy to make me stronger, which is like super, super cool. And the clinic that does the gene therapy is at the other end of the island from most of the charter city. It's just that that building is opted into the jurisdiction. And we're working on a project in Africa I'm really excited about, uh, where again, the legislation we're working on says that same thing. So this ability to like be non-contiguous and incorporate land into the jurisdiction, right, is more like that that admiralty law. Like the thing is that this this like metaphor of of you know law as code, this is it's not just like a shallow metaphor. If you think of law as an infrastructure layer, like what's special about law is that, you know, to change the sewers, you have to like go down and like move pipes around. But law is like just an agreement about what rules apply to what place. It's like a bit in a database, right? Or like a line on a piece of paper. And so we can be using it much more flexibly. We, we could have, you know, there's no reason that, you know, a person's property couldn't opt into, you know, a different legal system in some way or do it like module by module. Be like, okay, like, um, here's an example of this really happening. Um, in, in Dubai, I'm not sure the rest of the UAE, but they made it so that foreigners who are living in Dubai can be under their own, their home country's family law, not for, for like, I think most EU countries. And, and the reason is that family law, it only governs relations between the family. This is things like, you know, who, like what happens in a divorce, who gets the kids, you know, the rules of a marriage. And so if a family opts into it, that doesn't affect anybody else in the country, right? It only governs them. And so they recognize, hey, here's a case where we could just flip this bit and a family could choose German family law if they wanted to. You know, of course, they're entrepreneurial. They want to attract people to live there. And people don't want, you know, people who are not Muslims do not want to live under Muslim family law. And so that's just this characteristic of law that I think that we are like way under exploiting, that it actually is a virtual layer. It is like code and we could be, you know, remixing it. And, you know, it law is open source, by the way, because anything that's not a secret policy is published in its entirety. So all law is open source and, you know, we can be, we can be copying it and forking it. So I think this is something that, just needs to be to be used way more is that it kind of the law like it is a cyberspace attribute in a sense it's like a virtual attribute of you know of of physical places and we're not using it as such but yeah i just i you know i think of my mission as as trying to make um governance in the world of atoms be a bit more like things are in the world of bits and that's why you know that's why crypto is way ahead of starting new countries um, you know, because it's, it's out there in cyberspace where it's just innately easier, um, to do new things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I guess my hope is that like, um, I mean, there's a lot of things to unpack there that, that really excite me, right? Like first going to a different jurisdiction where a gene therapy is, uh, has more freedom to, to, uh, um, to unroll or deploy into markets, you know, um, this idea of having non-contiguous sort of uh, establishment of uh, uh, jurisdiction um, is also, I mean, it exists, you know, already, but like to have more of a process around that and like have the private markets engage in that kind of activity is, is fast, uh, super fascinating to me. Um, and then like having different countries already adopting or allowing themselves to change how certain aspects of law work within their jurisdiction it's also incredible. And I, I guess like, like, where do you see that going? Like, I mean, surely that must inspire you and like make you feel like it's like going on the right track in some way. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, another example I'm excited about right now is, um, 
base is, is this open source idea. So um, one of our companies, Metropolis, uh, working in Palau and, and some other countries in the, in the South Pacific, Palau is creating a corporate registry where you can incorporate using the laws of Delaware to start, and then they'll add other jurisdictions because, you know, just like a German couple in Dubai, you know, their, their family law affects them. If you're going to register an offshore corporation in Palau, like why should Palau have to write some new corporate law for that? Like why try to reinvent the wheel when they can just use best practices? Delaware law and the new precedents that are set, you know, are, are freely available and so they incorporate Delaware law by reference, not by copying. It updates as the law updates. You know, they're importing it like a software library. And this way you could use your standard startup docs, right? Or you could port, um, you could port a Taiwanese corporation to Palau if you're worried about the, the security of Taiwan using all of your same corporate documents and resolutions, just cho- copying them over. So these things are happening. I'm, I talked to someone in in uh, Prospera a month ago, who's working with El Salvador to pass Delaware corporate law for the country. Um, so these kinds of, of amazing things are happening. And, you know, I think it's just, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I guess I have a desire for change, but it's, it's, I'm queuing in on an actual, like, fact about the structure of the world here with viewing laws as code. And so as, you know, you get the word out and other people you know, independently discover it, that you can't have law be more flexible. It's, it's just going to happen more and more. And so, you know, I, we, we have a legal system um, on GitHub. It's called Ulex. It's um, work. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, Tom, Tom Bell's work. It's an attempt to create kind of a kernel, right? A, like a simplified generic kernel. You know, I, I have this metaphor that the way that legal systems are right now is it's like, what if every country only ran operating system that like had been written by that country, you know, or like maybe the colonizers came in and they brought in some bits of their own operating system, you know, and then they left. And like, instead of everybody using Linux, you know, or Linux and its competitors, right? Like, like there's no, I, I don't like, like law is a technology, right? And we shouldn't have to keep like reinventing it from scratch. Like I want to see a world where you have legal systems on GitHub, where you have standard kernels, where you have distributions, right? Like, oh, because if there's a whole bunch of different like modules and variations of that modules that different jurisdictions are trying, then you're going to need somebody to package them up in a distribution, right? And like all of those open source concepts, I think, I think we'll have for law. And, you know, so that's, that's super exciting. Me. Absolutely. Um, like I, I'm very, uh, very familiar with Tom Bell's book, you know, uh, Your Next Government, and his idea around, um, you know, uh, autocentric law and polycentric law and, the, and these sort of things. Um, and to that end, uh, I was a little bit disappointed with uh, with the current version of Ulex because uh, it's pointing to the American Law Institute's restatements of law, right, um, law you know, contracts and so on. Um, and so to that end, similar to your uh, homegrown DIY blogging platform. Uh, we've been working on a platform that allows us to reconstitute the restatements of law, right? Because mm-hmm. the black letter rules uh, themselves are under copyright uh, and enforced by the ALI. And so, um, you know, Tom makes the argument in his book, like why that might not be the case or why you could argue that it is in the public domain. Um, and and I, it is convincing in some ways, but it hasn't been tested. Uh, but if you could then restate the restatements, you know, and establish these, then you could get that body of law, that kernel into GitHub and have version control and all of these things. Um, and then ideally that's the, the basis for your arbitration system that is running on top of a, uh, an order that can't be easily tampered with. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. And, uh, on the registries, like that's also fantastic. I was speaking to, um, a guy from uh, Kenya who lived outside of Nairobi, um, and there was a dispute between uh, himself who and another uh, claimant on uh, a deed to property, right, to uh, real estate, um, which necessitated, necessitated him a week of travel to, to Nairobi to go to the registry and find out that both of you had the, the same claim, right, like just the paper-based system or corruption, basically failed them, right? And so he spent two weeks get there and back 
didn't resolve it. Where if you had, you know, that registry on uh, something that was um, a bit more accessible, I guess, um, then maybe you could save these like two weeks of transaction costs in, you know, establishing that and still being at square square one. Um, so so yeah, um, I I feel I think very similarly on that front. Um, okay, so I, I guess like. Um, You've moved to land now. Um, you're looking at charter city like, uh, cities and setting up startup cities, um, especially like with own. Um, so maybe moving a little bit further down the spectrum away from secessionists. Um, I, I'm curious, and you've established Pronomos now, right? This venture capital firm that is, that is working on that. Um, could you speak a little bit about it and like uh, what, what's the investment thesis um, of this new entity? Sure. Um, so pronomos, it's it's from nomos, which is the ancient Greek word for law, um, which w- was the ancient Greek word for custom. And then they made the same word law because they felt that law was derived bottom up as like a you know like a a hardening of of customs. Um, and it's the only charter city investment fund. I uh, started it the about four years ago, and. You know, I started working on it after I saw Prospera get its initial approvals in 2017 and started to see, you know, that with the crypto boom, there is more and more money going to people who believed in these kinds of ideas and um, more countries interested in Charter Cities ideas. And so I decided to, to start a fund so that I could work kind of across the industry and in helping make these things happen. Um, we're a very small $13 million fund. Uh, anchored by Peter Thiel, who's been my main supporter in my career. And we've got in, just incredible investors like Balaji, Naval, you know, Mark Andreessen, uh, you know, Roger Ver, Brock Pierce, Olivia Janssen's from, from crypto. Um, really blessed to have a, a lot of amazing people. And we've invested in, I think it's 11 companies now. Uh, over four years, we're about 60% deployed. And, you know, the thesis is just that we invest in cities. They get to write most of their own laws. That's that's the way I say it now. I've actually I've been I've been ha- having to like both laser focus and and kind of say no a lot because with network states, um, network states and seasteading, and there's a huge wave of like non-sovereign communities happening. Like just people like are ready to reinvent how we live together. Um, and I have this idea of like a. Uh, of a, of a sovereign community as like a group of people who say, we're going to take some portion of the way life is lived of like the civilizational tech stack that we think is shit. And we're going to rewrite it, um, and then live under it and test it. And this could be education. Um, I talked to someone about a, a healthcare city. I'm really excited about, um, it can be all kinds of things, but there's a huge wave of it, but like, but that's not my thing. So I've had to like come up with this like kind of brief phrase and it's this like cities that write most of their own laws. Um, and so that's what we invest in. And, you know, I guess, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm supposed to, 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 to say this, but like, like the hope <laughs> is that you invest at early stage software valuations in companies that end up managing like multi-billion dollar real estate portfolios. Um, you know, and if you can do that, then, uh, then you'll do well. So we invest generally pre-seed and seed. We've done like uh, our two largest checks are like 1.1 and 1.5 million. Smallest checks are 100K. Um, and, you know, those larger checks are in Prospera, which is like the only operating charter city. And then just uh, just this fall in our own company that, that we started ourselves working in Africa. Um, and, you know, and that's it. We We... You know, I, I kind of have like the the longest history in this space and the biggest idea maze. So we're a bit more hands on than the average VC, although still, you know, it's 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 mostly up to the founders always. Um, and you know, we also do oh, like matching people up with vendors. You know, occasionally talking to to countries, although surprisingly rare. If you told me, you know, five years ago that. I wouldn't bother talking to countries. I would have said you're, you know, you're crazy. Like in the in the 2010s, there was like French Polynesia working with the seasteading with, with Blue Frontiers and seasteading for a bit. You had Honduras and like 
was like kind of it. You know, you were lucky if like there was a country that would talk to you like once every five years. Um, but now, you know, this the this wave is 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 happening. I think like the 21st century is here. I have this this line that the 21st century started in 2020. Uh, you know, just meaning that COVID brought an end to like the delusion that things worked the old way. Mm -hmm. And so there's more and more countries realizing that, you know, they have to do things in 21st century ways. But, you know, what what my shortage is, which I, I hear is, is, is true all the time, um, is founders. Um, so I don't follow up with countries because I don't have any any great founding teams to, you know, to put on on projects like that's the shortage. And, you know, I need to think more about why this is It's something I'm going to work on this this coming year. But, you know, one thing is just the scale and the ambition of it. Right. I mean, I have unicorn CEOs tell me like, wow, that's like so much bigger than what I would consider working on, you know, to start like a new jurisdiction. You know, even even if it's a charter city and not a country, it's um, it's huge. It's a huge undertaking. And, you know, ambition is is rare in this world. Uh, I also think that to operational founders, this is still kind of like not pie in the sky, but like it's a cool idea that like will happen and should happen someday off in the unknown future. And, you know, I, I need to get the word out to these guys that like, no, you can roll up your sleeves and do it now. You know, I can connect you to countries. I can talk to you about what the milestones are, what your team should look like. Like it, it's, it's time, like, like you can do this. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's, that there's other reasons, but that's, that's kind of a, a big bottleneck in the space. And that's why our last three checks that took us from 40 to 60% deployed um, we're all, we're like to no new founders. Um, it was to two existing companies and to our own company that, that we started. Um, so well, yeah, that's well, I, how it is. So, yeah. I mean, th there's kind of two things to, to unpack and like, we should have probably got to this a bit earlier. Um, like you, you mentioned that there now is this wave and like, there's all of there's this sort of this Cambrian explosion, or I guess like finally these thousands of startup societies are finally blooming or starting to bloom um, in a way. Um, and my question was going to be like, well, why do you think someone would go to one of these places or live under, like what is the benefit to, to an individual or, or a community to, to even do this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a better jurisdiction. If you look at, um, if you look at studies of what drives economic growth, the quality of the institutions and lack of corruption are, are huge factors. Um, I've, I've lately been, been thinking in terms of um, kind of like, let's say like community first versus economic first, uh, where okay. a community first city is the kind that I would want to live in, where you get a group of people with a certain set of values that are not well served by existing countries and where those values would actually drive them to want different laws, you know, could be, uh, could be libertarians, um, you know, could be, could be all kinds of different groups. Um, you know, people who want to live in a city without plastics. Um, right. and you, you bring that group of people together online. And this is very much the network state model of, of Bologies is, you know, you have your one moral commandment, you form a tribe online, people get to know each other, you meet up in person at intervals, you know, the new innovation of this year uh, is the, the pop-up community pioneered by Zuzulu, where 200 people got together for two months, um, you know, living together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, it, 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 it was amazing. And so just kind of starting off online, but adding the offline component more and more over time. And then, you know, and Praxis is the leader of this. They've got 15,000 people. They've had an offer from a government and, you know, fingers crossed, they'll be the, the next one to, you know, announce that they're actually going to build a charter city. And so, you know, we'll see. Well, like Praxis seems like maybe they're doing it. That's awesome. I know like this is like what I would want to live in. But as an investor and an entrepreneur, <laughs> like, man, is it hard to convince people with like great lives in the developed world to go and move someplace else, 
like, like, yeah, I want to live together with my people in like a country that's based around my values, but like, man, moving like away from my family, I have like, I have kids, um, you know, that's it's it's a big, big ask. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the economic driven is if you say in Africa, there's 20 to 30 million people a year moving to cities because it's still urbanizing and it has the youngest population by far in the world. I mean, like, well, isn't like half of Nigeria under 18 or something crazy? Oh, yeah. So there's new people being born. They're moving to cities. You don't have to convince anyone to move anywhere. You don't need a sales department. You just need to build a city that's like a bit nicer than alternatives. And like people will, will move there. So it's an entirely, <laughs> entirely different thing. Or if you, you know, if you build a, a, a city around some, you know, some resource, some industry cluster, like really, you know, if you have a set of laws that's much better for, some type of business and you can partner with those businesses and set up a zone where you're able to to provide better jobs you know based on this kind of economic driver of like better laws means it's better for the business means they can pay more to employees like again you don't need your sales department is your is your job postings like and and like that's how the united states grew Right, the United States in the in the nineteenth and and first half of the twentieth century, when there were years that a million people a year uh, moved here, when the population was you know was was much smaller, that was all economic driver. Like there was land, there was economic opportunity, and people were willing to pick up and move, you know, across an ocean that was a much much bigger journey back then, with a lot more uncertainty because of that driver. And so I'm kind of torn between this like community is being like advanced, like, you know, high, high up on Maslow's hierarchy thing that I want to live in. But like, as an investor, I feel like, you know, it's the, it's the economic, just build a city where there's better jobs and that's it. You've answered the question of why will someone go live there? Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, maybe first one comes for uh, one comes first and then the, the proceeds from that gets it reinvested into the, into the, the other one. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's my hope. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, like this sort of founder shortage problem or team um, shortage problem, like what is the ideal team for formation there? And like, what are the capital costs, you know, for establishing, you know, one of these charter cities? So like, how do you think about that? Yeah. Um, so team is something I've, I've changed my mind on lately. I mean, I, I, I will say that I think it's mostly just the standard like entrepreneur like except they have to be maybe have to be a, maybe a lot more ambitious than than the average entrepreneur um but all of this all of those startup skills are 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 just the first thing um at the end of the day it's a startup and then the i think the other the other two skills that are important um one of them is community growth you know, especially if you're taking this community direction, um, you know, but in general, getting the first, you know, even if it's economically driven, you know, the first hundred people, the first thousand people, like this is a community, like you need to, you need to nurture it. You need to, to learn the culture um, and have people feel inspired. And then the other is real estate development. You know, that's, that's just at the end of the day, you know, that's what this is. It's not, it's not why I'm in it, right? I want to like start new countries that, you know, have way better legal systems, but what we're doing is real estate development. And so all of those skills, um, you know, I met up with um, a, a libertarian, uh, the rare like hard libertarian real estate developer uh, a couple of weeks ago, I hadn't seen in, in 10 years. And he made a really compelling case that like, what does a real estate developer do? They have some vision for what this will be and why people want to live there. And they wrangle the capital, they wrangle the permits, they come up with like the sales process and they kind of do everything, like all the glue to make it happen. And that's, that's really what we need. So I think those are kind of the, you know, the, the main skill sets. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I guess we're coming up close to time. Now, is there anything you want to discuss or, or talk about? Any other sort of thoughts that you think are worth bringing up? Hmm. I 
I have one for, I, I guess, um, maybe I bring it. further down the question, like um, books. What kind of books would you recommend, you know, either founders that are interested in these ideas um, or just like how, and understanding how governments work um, or don't work? Like, what are your recommended reads? Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a little bit delinquent on, on putting together my, my reading list, but I, I have actually been assembling it here, like on my bookcase. I have a section of like the books that form my worldview. And then I have a whole shelf of like utopian escapist fiction, mostly <laughs> libertarian, which is divided into two sections. The stuff that's like based on seasteading and my work, and then the stuff that's that's not. Um, and I have a haters section that's very important. Um, uh, you know, multiple books published in the last couple of years that are you know about hating on this whole on this whole movement. Um, but the list that we do have, the Charter Cities Institute has a good recommended reading list. And my old blog, Let a Thousand Nations Bloom, which was the first group blog about competitive governance. I started with uh, with Mike Gibson, now 1517 Fund and some others has, you know, uh, 10 years out of date, but, um, you know, really good, has a lot of the classics. Um, but, I, you know, it's things like public choice theory. My favorite is Mansur Olson. Um, you know, my dad's Laws, Order, and Machinery of Freedom. Jane Jacobs, I, uh, I think is really important. Um, the, the Lee Kuan Yew uh, biography from Third World to First. Um, there's, I think there, there's, there's at least one good uh, Dubai story as well. Um, you know, at, at Glazer on cities. I mean, there's, there's actually, there's this one good book called how to start your own country, which was written in the, I don't know, eighties, early nineties, right. which was like, you know, it, it was unusual in that this space was so LARPy right? Like micronations. It was mostly people who were like, let me make up my own flag <laughs> and, and anthem. And, and, and that's fine. If, if that's what's fun for you, I think that's awesome. Um, but how to start your own country was, was a guy who actually took the idea seriously and wrote a whole small book about, you know, how could you actually do this? So that one's still a classic. I think there's um, there's another book that came out on Micronations uh, by Cambridge, uh, Micronations and the Search for Sovereignty uh, by Harry Hobbs and George Williams, I think it is. But it actually treats the phenomenon quite seriously, right? Um, it's a good read. I think you'd enjoy it if you haven't come across your way. Cool. But, um, you're probably familiar with it all uh, anyway. Um, cool. I, I guess like the hater section is kind of interesting. And I, I guess that kind of popped up another idea in my mind, like, you know, you, we've kind of touched upon some of the trials and tribulations of like manifesting this idea into into reality. Um, you've seen some success, and like more of it's coming. Um, what kind of the sort of criticisms have you received, and like how would you how do you answer them? I guess. I mean, there's there's lots. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have a good time. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I've spent twenty years hearing the criticisms and responding, and you know. I don't know. I, I think it's fun. Um, I think I feel like the the biggest category is the people who see it as some kind of like evil neo colonialist capitalist yeah. enslavement and exploitation. People who sort of live in zero sum economic models where if somebody wins, somebody has to lose, and they assume that like if we are like building something in a country and people like choose to go work there that we're like, that they're like losing out, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's nonsense, but it's just how a lot of people think. And then, you know, I mean, less, less nonsense is just concerns about, um, about power imbalances. Right. And about like, uh, you know, here's a standard one is like, will there be a two tier system Right. If you have some combination of, let's say, uh, digital nomads from the developed world and people from the host country, you know, those are going to be two pretty different groups of people at different levels of wealth, different uh, economic niches. And, you know, it 
it is something that that you should worry about. Um, you know, but I guess I, I see these these cities that the goal is to uplift the country and the region, um, you know, to mix together people who have this like valuable experience of doing things like starting countries and people who have like hustle and drive. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, most of these, most of the, well, there's the criticisms about like, it can't work. And then there's the criticism about it'll be bad. And I think that it'll be bad stuff. It's, it's just, it's based on like imagining a future. It's like being in some fantasy world in your mind that is untethered from reality. And to me, this is the whole point. Like with, with seasteading, I was like, look, like, instead of arguing, you know, over beers or whatever on Twitter about, well, this society be good. Well, that one be good. Is mine better? All that crap. Like, let us build it and look at it, right? Let's evaluate a society by how it actually is the real thing and not like our imagination. Whoa, Siri did not like that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and instead of just reflecting our political prejudices or, you know, the, the direction that, that we predict things will go, which is rarely right. Like, what if we visit a place? What if we talk to the people and say, you know, hey, do you feel exploited? Um, you know, and, and if we think they won't tell the truth, let's just find someone who moved out, right? Like, let's let's see how these things actually are in practice. And so I'm almost coming to a like, you know, my inclination for a long time would be like to argue with these people. Right. And, to, and, and now my inclination is kind of like, you know what? I hear you think it'll be like that. I don't, you know, come back in five years and, and let me know what you think. Like, it's just not even worth engaging in an argument with just somebody's imagination uh, yeah. when we can find out what the reality is. Absolutely. I mean, and if you can make a system that can prove that there's cheap exit costs and uh, cheap voice costs, um, and um, uh, yeah, like it, it is voluntary. And I, I guess also another part of that is uh, governmental immunity, right? If you can show that there is no governmental immunity and like the government uh, is held to civil liabilities, then like you can make a strong argument that those kind of arguments would not really yeah. stand up to scrutiny. And like, of course, people can have those opinions, but they wouldn't reach a, a larger or broader population. Um, I, I think the colonialism one is, is also quite interesting. Um, I mean, there's a lot of baggage and almost educational conditioning that's behind that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that's kind of, that's nonsense as well. Um, well, depending on, on the actual start of society and what the rules and structures are and, you know, the, these sort of things. Um, okay, well, I guess like, you know, we're out of time. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for speaking with me and I hope to, you get to see and experience the society of your dreams um, in reality. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on.